All right, welcome to part B, part B of lecture 12. Professor Barth here. Part A was a little lengthier than I had initially intended. About 26 minutes long. You know, there are some people who argue that if the video goes beyond 10 minutes, you've lost your audience. And I uh, hope that's not the case. Or or maybe, maybe, maybe the fact is that if you're watching this, the type of person who's watching a video like this maybe is a little more tolerant of an occasional 20 minute or 25 minute video. Part B, today we are taking a look at mercantilism. It's a subject that I've, in my uh, own research, my own scholarly research, I've, I've worked on and published on. In fact, my upcoming book in spring 2021 deals very heavily with mercantilism in the 17th century. So this is my period. All right, here we are. This is a, a portrait of Louis the 14th the Academy of uh, Sciences, I believe it was. It's an interesting portrait because, you know, there there is His Highness and the globe, the European nation state. And this is a period of consolidation uh, and, and the beginning of, of new empires. And at the forefront, <laughs> Of, of the formation and construction of these empires is an economic theory, a new economic theory called mercantilism, mercantilism. And I have some approximate dates there. Now there are problems with, with pinpointing an exact date. And there are some disputes about what mercantilism was precisely. I'm gonna just give you the boiled down version of it and and leave it at that, but for about a century and a half, this economic theory or maybe worldview would be a better way to put it, utterly dominated European imperial thought and economic thought in the 17th and up through the 18th centuries, middle of the 18th century. Mercantilism was a term broadly referring to this idea that the state, that government ought to, in a, a systematic way, manage and regulate trade in order to ensure a trade surplus, an overall trade surplus for that home country, or what mercantilists called a favorable or a positive, usually called it a favorable balance of trade. What was a favorable balance of trade? Favorable balance of trade is a trade surplus where you export more goods on balance than what you import from abroad. Why did mercantilists place so much emphasis on the trade balance? Well, because if you, if you buy more goods from abroad than you sell, there's a deficit. How is a deficit how is a deficit paid for? With money, with silver and gold. So if you run continual trade deficits, money, silver and gold will leave the country. On, uh, on the contrary, if you run continual trade surpluses, if you export more goods than you import, then that surplus will come in as a profit to the home country in the form of incoming silver and gold. Now I have favorable here in scare quotes because later critics of mercantilism, Adam Smith being the most famous, although David Hume is actually uh, one of the first critics of, of this theory, disputed that you know a trade surplus is by definition favorable. favorable. And Smith and then later Ricardo argued that in some cases, trade that leads to a, a deficit may actually still be favorable for the home, for the home country. So having favorable here in, in, in the quotations, the quotes, uh, but a mercantilist would have uh, agreed with the general principle that on balance, if you take all the foreign trade, put it together on balance, you want more goods exported out of the country than you want imported into the country, leading to silver and gold. Uh, coming in and then remaining within within the country. The example of Spain taught mercantilists two key lessons. Two key lessons. First, the futility in focusing chiefly or exclusively 
on mining only. The Spaniards were so focused on mining as a way to acquire wealth that they neglected industry, manufacturing, agriculture, exported exports. And as a result, they lost their money, right? And 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 declined as a European power. Number two, the decline of Spain also taught mercantilists the importance, the, the fundamental centrality in securing a positive balance of trade and securing trade surpluses because Spain just dealt with these perpetual trade deficits and that, that this contributed to Spain's downfall. Spain belonged to the so-called Bolianist school of economic thought. The Bolianist school focused on acquiring money through acquiring silver and gold in Bolian form through mining or through conquest. And, and oftentimes those two just went hand in hand. And this was a sort of a type of a King Midas fallacy. King Midas fallacy. If you know the the legend of King Midas. King Midas had a wish, uh, or he was permitted to uh, have this wish, and, and he desired to that everything he would touch would turn into gold. Well, it turned out that that was an awful idea. It didn't work out so well, because you need other things other than gold. Gold is fine. Gold is necessary if gold happens to be money in that period. And But the fact of the matter is, there are many, many other things that you absolutely need. And so it backfired on him. In the same way, like King Midas, Spain, their mining exploits actually backfire in the country and, and ruin the country in a way because they neglected all of their activity. Mercantilists say, no, 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 no. The Mercantilist says, actually, you don't need any mines. You don't need mines. Uh, you, you know, if you have mines, fine. But you can get by without having any mines at all and you'll be all right. You just need a favorable balance of trade. And then you'll get all the gold and silver you could you could want or need. You'll have an optimum supply of gold and silver through trade. So trade more than mining. Trade is central to the mercantilist school. Mining is secondary, if not altogether just dismissed. And so with mercantilism, trade is now at the forefront more than ever before. We talked about this a bit with the commercial revolution in lecture 11. I'll give you a hint at how, how things have changed so much just within this, uh, this time uh, span of 100 years. In 1513, Machiavelli wrote in The Prince that princes should have no th care or thought but for war. For war is the sole art looked for in one who rules. Now that might have been relevant or true and pertinent in the early 16th century, but now it's not just war. War is still important. But now the prince must have an eye and a skill for trade. Trade, the economy, becomes vitally important to the state, not just to merchants. You know, in, in Italy, when Machiavelli is reading, uh, writing, you have a lot of trade going on with merchants, but now the state, the state has an interest in trade. The state has an interest in commerce. And the state totally buys into this new theory of mercantilism. And this, again, to, to encapsulate a bit, carefully regulating trade. So how do, you, how do you ensure that your country will have a trade surplus? Well, the idea was the state should go in and regulate trade. And you could regulate trade in various ways. You could prohibit certain areas of trade that you believe are harmful to the trade balance. You can levy tariffs on imported goods in order to discourage imports into your country. You can restrict different options regarding uh, the shipping of foreign goods to uh, uh, from and into the country. Also, many, many different bars and obstructions and all the rest, all intended to secure a trade surplus, an overall trade surplus for the home country, 
This will lead to more money coming into the country and then more money will lead to a more powerful state, a more powerful state. Money, there we go. This is mercantilism. Wealth equals power. Power, power and, and gold and silver go hand, in hand, go, go hand in hand. Warfare is more expensive now in the early modern age. It's expensive to fight wars. It costs money. If you're a king, if you're a state, you need money. Money will provide a state poli with political stability. Political stability. Customs revenue. So the, the, the tax that's levied on any goods exported from the country or any goods imported into the country becomes a vital source of revenue for many of these states. A wealthy merchant community can lend money to the state at low interest. All these, all these reasons, and it would take me, you know, I've, I'm, again, I'm writing a whole book on this, so I can, I'm only, I can only say so much in a few minutes, but all of these reasons why money was so central and so vital to to this early modern nation state and empire, as we'll see here in a moment. Another way to secure a trade surplus was through colonization, through colonies. Now again, Spain colonized the Americas, but again, focused on mining, mining. But Merkin will say, hey, we, you can have colonies without any mines at all, and yet they'll still bring gold and silver into a country indirectly by improving the mother country's by improving the home country's trade balance. Colonies can produce goods that the mother country imports from foreign countries. So instead of buying, so for example, I have tobacco here. Now when Virginia was first colonized by the English, you, you may know the story, you know, you see it in the Pocahontas Disney movie, in, which is, uh, I, I hate to tell you, fictional. But the early settlers in those first few years are searching for gold and they're, where's, where are the gold mines? They want to emulate the Spanish model. But within a few years, John Smith and, and other voices say, no, 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 no. You're wasting your time. Let's produce other things, other things that will help England. And they land on tobacco. Tobacco was previously imported actually from Spain. And it caused some trade deficits with, with from with, between England and Spain. So instead of buying tobacco from Spain, now the English can buy tobacco from its own colony. And so it, England effectively improves its balance of trade with Spain and then allows for more of that Spanish silver that we've been talking about to, to enter England. See how that works indirectly? No mine involved, but still ends up bringing more silver and gold into England. Sugar was another one. By the mid 17th century, some of the some of the uh, English colonies in the Caribbean, namely Barbados, and then in a little bit Jamaica, produce sugar, sugar, and so the English no longer have to import sugar from other countries. And in fact, not only does this improve the trade balance because they don't have to buy those goods from other countries, but if they have extra, and they did extra tobacco extra sugar they can english merchants can then re-export that extra tobacco that extra sugar to other countries in europe for a profit thus bringing in more gold more silver into the home country see how that works with colonies and you can you see why mercantilist greatly valued colonies but in the same way that you know, when we were talking about mercantilists in the, in the home country, when it came to colonies, Mercantil said colonial trade must be managed, it must be regulated, it must be restricted for the purposes of enriching the mother country. Regulated, managed, and restricted for the purposes of enriching the mother country. And for this reason, yeah, sometimes the relationship between the colony in the mother country could become quite tense because the mother country is essentially telling that colony, you are subordinate. You are subordinate to our goals. And so 
as these colonial economies matured and this desire arose in those colonies to have the freedom to trade as they saw fit not as you know england told them so not as the mother country dictated to them this is going to be one of many reasons obviously for the american revolution later in the 18th century this desire to sort of free them uh, to free themselves from from these restrictions this is a later cartoon from the early 20th century but it still captures the same principle there's the mother country and the colony the colony serving the mother country all these commodities and the mother oh for me all right this that works out just fine and this is the theory the theory so mercantilism and colonization actually work pretty hand in hand together although mercantilism doesn't just the only deal with colonies okay mercantilism also it deals with all aspects of a country's overseas trade <laughs> there's a there's an image here mercantilism for the good of the motherland i did a little search online mercantilism and looked to see if i could find any good solid images and this came up for the good of the motherland all right so you know what actually i'm, I'm going to make a part c and, and divide this video up into two, into two. So for part C of lecture 12, the final part, we're gonna look at three case studies, three examples, very, very briefly, England, Holland, and France, and see how they use some of these principles, as well as just global commerce to become fabulously wealthy in the 17th and into the 18th century. So I will see you for part C.